I just want to talk with you for a few minutes about what CFOs are dealing with because you've spent a lot of time on this topic. And this was one of the core things we heard about here, which was what are the problems facing today's CFOs and what are we going to do about it? And it's sort of a problem slash opportunities thing because the opportunity potentially is the, the CFO is more business relevant, serving lines of business in different ways. We talked about this CFGO concept of the growth officer. And then there's this whole goal of reducing admin, which is the whole eliminate the closed conversation versus being more strategic, which gets into more of the AI conversation in some ways. So what do you see about today's CFOs? Like, what is the struggle? And is there, is there an opportunity also here? Or are they just kind of screwed with all the stuff they're dealing with? Uh, for sure, CFOs, well, I, I don't buy the premise that they're singularly focused on one thing like growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a complex job uh, that has them bouncing around. And they also have their own career aspirations. Many of them, you know, I know, aspire to get the big chair and become the CEO of a company. But I'm not sure. I think statistically, they'll get their a fair share of them. We'll get a crack at that. But a lot of other people, either they're chief sales officer, chief revenue officer, chief um, operations officers, they also have a good crack at that role too. Um, anyway, what they're what I think they care about are the things that come up in operating committee meetings almost every single month or week, whatever. People are wondering, when are we going to win the war for talent? Why do we still have all these open positions? Even the CFOs got holes in their finance uh, organization that are longstanding and need to get filled. They know that they know because they're all, most of them are CPAs. They're talking to um, their local chapters and they know their problems getting the talent would go on. There's a bunch of them know that AI has great potential, but they don't know much about what exactly it could do or how they can do it in a private, secure fashion. And it's some of the downsides that scare the living daylights out of them. And I think, I think that's an appropriate kind of caution to have. I mean, these are some of these CFOs, particularly those who come from big four backgrounds, are going to be cautious. Uh, and they need, they need to understand this technology first before they're, um, and then they are able to then formulate what it is they want from a security perspective and privacy perspective, and then they'll move forward with it. I think the market has not done a good job of really educating the CFO in that, in that capacity. Another one I would just argue is the amount of regulation they have to deal with just keeps piling up. Mm -hmm. And even the ESG requirements from February this year for the U.S. firms are just further proof of more workload coming on an already overtaxed department. So would you agree with the general goal of we got to, we got to reduce the admin and compliance burden of the office of the CFO and try to create more opportunity for strategic endeavors as far as looking at the numbers, figuring out where to cut, where to grow? Like, is, is this a, is this a, the right goal? I think it's really hard to think strategically and take the time to come up with big, bold plans on what a CFO might want to do to grow the company and everything else. You can't do that if you're going from one fire drill to the next. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the calendar that the finance CFOs got, it's like every, every day it's like, oh, well, we're either doing a close or one of our subsidiaries where doing due diligence on a protectional M&A deal. we got the external auditors coming in. Oh, we got a governmental auditor coming in. we got a tax issue. we got a, you know, fight. And I mean, it's just one. Oh, and then, by the way, the, uh, a board member is flying in today at a last minute surprise, and we got to go, uh, go over current numbers and things with them. It's, there's just no end to the time demands on there. So until you can use these tools to free up time and, and, even if that is using AI to notate financial statements and do the initial analysis for you, that's a great use of an AI tool that could possibly save days off of some financial analyst and or CFO. They could just request it in a matter of a couple of minutes. It could annotate the entire briefing book for a CFO. That's a phenomenal kind of time saving, but that's, I think, where we we have to focus on the fact that the time the CFO has is incredibly scarce and limited. And there was a somewhat cynical 
a comment from one of the analysts that's been following this space for a long, long time. Not well, another one of mine, please. It wasn't you, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> surprisingly enough. And, and the comment was like, because we were talking about the sort of shift in CFO role and the Im impact of that, more strategic CFOs. He said, we've been talking about this for 30 years. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, and there's some truth to that, right, that these problems don't really go away. But the potent question becomes, do you think modern tooling, so-called modern software, can, can this help? Why can this help with this problem? Or is this just hot air? When I thought about very the, long pause there, Brian, very, yeah, very long pause. When I thought about when that happened in the meeting, uh, I, I was reflecting then on something in my own personal career. Uh, <clears throat> I got told once in a performance review by one of my bosses at headquarters at Accenture, he goes, he's rattling off all these things that I knocked off that year. I mean, amazing accomplishments. It was, I was involved in the sale of over a billion dollars in client project revenue. Uh, that's no small task. And I took on headquarters on a bunch of boneheaded kind of things. They were trying to squish down on folks. Anyway, he asked me, you know, point blank, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, wh where do you really want to spend your time? And what he didn't understand is how I n never worked weekends. I did all my work like on planes and trains because I'm always traveling every day, traveling some plant part of the planet. And I, as time w went on, I got ever more productive. I was always looking for things to make me more personally productive. But you know what? The, the essence of this, it's the same problem we've been hearing about for 30 years issue is, yeah, I kept finding more ways to be productive, but I wasn't using necessarily the free time in a way that was giving, that I got to use personally. I was in putting that, free, that time I freed up to do other things at work. Right. And I think these CFOs, even if they are freeing up some time, I think other things are filling up that time and they may not be at, they may not be allowing the CFO to think and deal with strategic issues as much as they say they might want to. So just real quick, before we wrap this short CFO discussion, you mentioned one AI use case that you liked in terms of sort of analyzing preliminary numbers and things like that. Mm -hmm. Are there other AI scenarios for the office of the CFO that you've said, yeah, that would be very useful. There's another one where the AI tool will automatically generate the briefing book. It's, it's almost figuring out all the, the images, the charts and whatever it goes and finds all that and assembles it together. Then you add the annotation capability where it annotates the content in there. And that is astonishing. If, if, you know, even if you can't close the books in real time, to be able to do that anytime during the month and get this, this incredible briefing material with all that analysis baked in there would be fantastic. We just got to make sure it doesn't hallucinate something. But yeah, that would be phenomenal. Oh, and the other thing that's really cool about this is it all has the drill down, drill around capability to back it up. So if the CFO wants to, or whoever they're sharing with wants to learn more, understand more, they can keep going all the way down to the source documentation. That's killer. Our, I like that. Our, our pal, um, William Park from Amalgam Research, he, he wrote about this concept of instant mediocrity at scale, describing AI, generative AI use cases. And I really like that phrase because he was using it more complimentary than negative because he was trying to get, get, get you to think about like, well, it, and, and I'm not saying that every AI for finance solution is mediocre. In fact, the whole focus of companies like say, just to try to make the output actually incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. But the point is more like, yeah, maybe this scenario that the AI is running isn't perfect, but it can do it every day, mm -hmm. which forces you to rethink in positive ways how you might use that, right? Because your imperfect human version of that is going to take, you're going to have to do that once a month or once a quarter, right? So now 
like you're saying, maybe you could run certain projections every day or every week as often as you need it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's interesting, right? Cause that, that's, oh, that's a different huge. capability. Yeah. If you're running like a big retail operation, you can see things on a daily basis about like the movement of which goods are you know, turned out to be more seasonal than maybe you thought, or it gives you a heads up as to we're going to run out of something that we weren't planning on. Uh, and you know, it's, it, it can pick off the trend stuff a whole lot quicker and faster. So yeah, I I like all that. Um, but we still got to do a lot of proof points around it because right, this year has been more about setting up guardrails and responsible architectures and, and starting to get this stuff rolled out. Like it won't be until probably the fall and maybe next spring before we actually hear from customers about how they're using it. So it's going to take a while. Or how it gets priced. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, don't think, ROI, I don't think the ROI implications of that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think people are going to buy the technology. I, I never advise a client to sign a contract they don't understand or where there's missing gaps in the pricing or whatever. That's just not smart business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we wrap. But if you want to get further into what customers should be asking vendors about AI, Brian wrote a piece about that. <laughs> Check yeah, it out. in fact, we had a we had a guest on the uh, on the show. Um, oh yeah, we actually had a month in review show on that too. That we went into that. So yeah, he took that post and turned it into the um, into like a spreadsheet of additional questions to give vendors as part of their R five. All uh, right, Brian, let's leave it there for now, man. Good to talk. Thank you, John. All right, and we'll see you on the road soon. Yep, sounds good. <laughs>